Okay. So today's session is about Spring Cloud. It is basically first uh, session on the Spring Cloud and how you can build microservices on Spring Cloud. So we're just going to briefly discuss about the individual comp uh, all the components that are comprising of the Spring Cloud project. And then gradually throughout the month, we'll be discussing the individual component that is under Spring Cloud. Today, we're going to be completing what is the cloud native architecture is. We're going to see a sample demo architecture. We understand what are the main Spring Cloud components. And how can you use Spring Cloud for architecting this demo application? Then we can jump to the code. Anybody has an idea to, to what is the cloud native? This is one of the buzz term that we currently are able to find. No, sir. Basically, that application, whatever we develop, we develop keeping the cloud in mind on cloud is mostly a distributed system group of application there is no like monolithic application rather that is a distributed across multiple cloud or in a single cloud or maybe distributed across the geographical region that is been broken around okay so it is not hosted in a single server or limited number of server it is hosted on multiple servers and this is like a application is built on in a distributed nature then second point is your cloud native application is can generally both to scale up and scale down Okay, that means when there is a load on the system or absence of the load, it can automatically scale the number of server or worker load the application can be used to process it. Third thing is resiliency. So if there is like any error goes, one of the subcomponent fails, it doesn't fail the whole application. It keeps your application still running. So it is resilient to failure or it has a failure recovery method or a failure mitigation method because things can fail very often. And the cloud native infrastructure is scalable or elastic, right? It involves automated process to scale them build them deploy them run them and they can be grouped or organized into different sub component and cloud native application can be replaceable from one particular cloud with the component of another cloud or application can be hosted in a different cloud altogether so it is not cloud dependent, but it is kept in mind to create it based on the cloud, public clouds that we have. Okay. Yes. Okay. Now, there is some myth uh, around the cloud the distributed computing okay what are the fallacies sir network is reliable network has never been reliable even if it is hosted in the cloud there may be a calamity can occur 
in particular region that will disturb the particular application that is running there. And when we have like not a single server, all the components are distributed across multiple servers or multiple apps. So latency, that is when the inter-server communication is never been zero. Obviously, the bandwidth on the server side or the client side is not infinite. What is the network? Its neighbor is secure. And the application topology, or what is the application is different is composed of, maybe change. It is nothing is static out here. And it's not a single application, so there is not a single administration is there. There is maybe multiple teams having like multiple administrator, operation team, DevOps team, Dev team, etc. And the transport cost is never is zero. So whatever you know, input output you do over this network has cost. A network cannot be homogeneous. It may be a hybrid crowd. For example, one is on premise and one is in AWS, and they can be integrated together. So it may be hybrid cloud. So network cannot be always be homogeneous. So all these are basically myth. Now another concept that is popular twelve factor application. So what is 12-factor application? So it is a popular uh, concept, which is uh, saying is that the application can, should be cloud-native application and 12-factor authentication. And uh, this concept is come from Heroku when they have building their cloud platform. So it need to be have supporting 12 features. And these features can be translated to other cloud servers, right? So it's basically one individual application, one single service, right? A single process that is running. So here's Code should be in a version control that is under gate, and it be dependent on other services. Uh, the configuration are there, like uh, into environment baked in. There are like continuous delivery and building, continuous integration, like build, release, and run. There is one process that is running per application. There may be a concept we find in Kubernetes, like Sidecar Ambassador, where one particular application may be comprising of multiple processes. And there is every application is exposed to the outside world with by opening a certain one or two port. Okay. And logs have been outputted then are there like concurrency can process request it has like the disposability means the servers are not fixed they can come and they can go as the scale may go up or they can crash the nodes can be crashed and they even pod environment is in parity they have like same okay so like this 12 factor authentication there uh, 12 factor application style there are other like 15 uh, factor application style is there so <clears throat> so basically when you start your journey to becoming a 
cloud native application. So at least a minimum, you need to support these 12 features to make it cloud compatible or cloud native. Now let's see a sample application architecture. So, <coughs> so basically it's different services are there. They are basically cloud application services are there. For example, it one uh, use case maybe it's applying for the credit card. So credit card application services there. Then it has the user service which is depend on. Then there is like a fraud verification whether the application is correct, is there or not. To and also this is going to be exposing to the external world using API gateway, right? So it is uh, then it also how the one service able to call the another service all service register itself with some kind of a service discovery and with the twelve factor application because the application servers and the worker nodes or containers can come and go so they are disposable so you require a naming service or a discovery service discovery is the card application service need to call the fraud verification service or user service you can do that one of the key thing is configuration of the environment so you need to have a separate configuration you like to see the logs that have been stored or matrices those have been collected so this is more or less what is the service architecture look like okay and also there can be a load balancer between the services and api gateway is there so all the communication is going via the api gateway so all of these are basically the pieces that are there distributed configuration that means current day <coughs> what happened is in our application we find that all the configurations are you know uh, set up at the time of the deployment and it is set up in the environment variable of each of the nodes so even if a single application there is like multiple nodes are there so if i need to change a value of any of the application servers uh, any of the configuration what i have to do i have to again redeploy that particular application because otherwise there is no way to you know change the configuration okay because the configuration is located within the particular application or within the service right now here we are saying instead of you know configuration is stored within the individual services rather than the configuration can be stored in a centralized configuration server and services can then read this configuration. So instead of I'm managing the configuration in individual services, I will be managing the configuration in centralized location. I can update that particular centralized configuration using application YAML or application properties file from maybe. And then the service A or service B can read from this particular component or it can be i can simply refresh them whenever there is a change they can read from it so that is the basic concept of distributed configuration so sir this will be a separate module right this config server yes From that, uh, this uh, individual services uh, will call the config server. Hmm. So any change in the config server also, I can you know 
call on the services to refresh it. Okay. So Spring Cloud do support uh, these config servers, and there are different ways we can you know store this configuration. One of the popular way is that basic we know that we can store it in a file system using application or ML or application properties file. <laughs> And within that particular file, I can store the configuration for multiple services in separately in a single file. I can have like five services and I can store that. Or I can uh, also wanted to put all my code and configuration into the VCS or versus controlling the source. So in that case, I can use Git. I can create a repository. And for each of the services, I can have the configuration defined there. Or I can use JDBC. I can store this configuration in a database also, backed by a database. So this config server can read from the database also. Or else, they can use uh, Create Hub, a product. Or Vault, that's another product. We store credentials along with configuration. <laughs> so they can do that and also I can use the underneath the infrastructure as a service or the cloud provider resources for example in AWS I can store that in SC bucket in a file okay and then <clears throat> I can uh, obviously do support retrying if it's failed to read from the database, it can again retry and then it can read the data from that particular configuration backable store. These are the different examples. Now we can you know, store the configuration. And then it has it gives a client to the Spin Cloud application. So Spin Cloud application can read those configuration from the config server. Okay. Also, there is another implementation that is Spring Cloud Console Client. So, Console Client is a product which uses HashiCorp Console Server. Okay, it can be stored both, it can be used along, Vault is also a HashiCorp product, but the console server also can be storing the configuration. So this project is connected to your HashiCorp console server, where it reads the configuration as a key value pair. The value can be stored per key basis, like a single string or JSON structure, or it can be stored a file path or file per key also, if you record detail configuration. And when there is like configuration get changed, you can update all your servers, you can refresh them. And it also has a Spring Boot application compliant kind to which you can use this sub project under Spring Cloud to connect with console. So con Spring Cloud do support HashiCorp console as well as it support HashiCorp vault. So that's the configuration server. The benefit of it, I don't have to go each and every server. I don't have to deploy the services if there is any configuration changes. OK, and core factor authentication is your configuration should not be in the environment and you should be able to change it. So our main application will not be unnecessary, goes down and create a maintenance window. OK. Other implementation of Spring Cloud Config Server are specifically to the Vault, Spring Cloud, Hashikov Vault. Zookeeper is an open source project, which is um, 
also used to store configuration that you can choose and uh, uh, ping cloud do support this four different public clouds it support aws so you can read from the sc bucket or the blob storage okay for majure or the corresponding similar storage mechanism than gcp or alibaba provide so, so what is the difference between the aws and spring cloud then no no spring cloud says what it let you create a cloud native application now where are you going to be running the cloud native application you can run the cloud native application in your private cloud or in public cloud what are the public cloud aws azure gcp alibaba right now if you wanted to be integrated with aws sqs as a message consumer or message center or if you wanted to read and write from the sc bucket how are you going to do that we are going to be writing that sort of code again no so what is the this sub project on the spring cloud provide they give you the spring higher level abstraction to interact with the specific public cloud resources like sc bucket s2s dynamo db etc so they basically provides libraries built-in libraries through which you can connect to different resources of the infrastructure as a service which is the main business of aws azure gcp and alibaba does it make you clear so spring cloud is one of the tools right spring cloud is a group of projects and say if you wanted to deploy your application on aws and you wanted to access aws specific resources okay, okay. then you can use the spring cloud aws dependency that let you connect to the rds dynamo db or kinesis stream etc is the bucket <coughs> sorry it is not mandatory to use these services but if you have a dependency from your application code that you need to access the aws services specifically okay then you can do that for example if you wanted to connect to a rds server you can connect over jdbc correct hmm. okay or if you want that the data source or connection pooling automatically created against the RDS instance. So, so you bring in Spring Cloud AWS. For example, you need to connect to DynamoDB. So what option you have? You have to use the AWS SDK to put it into a code base, right? You have to write all the boilerplate code to connect to the DynamoDB tables, query format, etc., etc. Instead of that, if you use Spring Cloud AWS, which is internally using the AWS SDK for Java, it automatically directly give you abstraction where you can simply use the Spring data repository and you don't have to write low level codes did you got it okay Thanks. okay now similarly if you are on a private cloud and you are using kubernetes and in the kubernetes itself you have like a security map and config map that we have discussed so you wanted to store those details and you wanted to read those configurations from there that also be supported okay so these are the different spring cloud config implementations are there i think during the netflix session we have discussed about eureka right 
there we have discussed about surface registry and discovery. So can anybody tell me what is the benefit of using this service discovery and registry? So we can means manage individual service very easily. Huh? We can manage individual service very easily, like using the pain client. No, 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 no. What is service discovery? One service needs to make a call to another service. That is the main requirement, right? Hmm. Then there is a component that will require is a registry. Registry will store what are the different instances are or servers are there for those services. In case we are talking about container, what are the different containers have been up? What are the different EK service or ECS services are up? Okay. So that registry stores that. So I have like three instances of service here. So service instance one, two, three, register with under the common name service. Now service B need to call service A. Similarly, what you need to do, you need to communicate with the service registry by knowing what are the service instances of service A. And then it may one of the instances call by the connect. Oh. It basically calls this API. Why do we require this? Because here the server IP addresses are not fixed. And it also let me discover services without their physical addresses. Physical address means IP address right now. So that's why we bring in the service registry in between. Okay. It both act as a registry as well as discovery. So you have seen this Eureka service that is there. So Spring Cloud, the Netflix, which has now only only one module, active module, because rest of the module that you have seen the original Netflix, sorry, ecosystem has been not maintained. So only Eureka is maintained. It's highly reliable. But it works on an eventual consistency. So, new service comes up. It nature itself. After a certain period, it may be available to process the request or it may be able to register. So, it will not be on an automatic, it will register, but there will be a eventually it will be able to figure it out. And Netflix itself. Is no more maintained the Eureka service rather than it uses the open source Spin Cloud Netflix models. Are there any other alternative apart from this service? Is the Asica console. The Asica console is another alternative product which supports service registry. So here, same like Asico console, where you can use one configuration, you can also Store as a registry for different other services in your ecosystem, and you can query and discover them. It is highly reliable, but it is strong consistency. It also has a separate service API, and it also supports health checks. And it has a Spring Boot client. So there is an alternative to console is the Spring Cloud console. We can use for configuration as well as for service discovery. Other notable mentions are if you wanted to use the open source product like Zookeeper, that you can also can use, that you also can be used to discovery. And from Alibaba, there is like Nacos product they have that you can also see if your application is deployed to Alibaba. Now we have seen the client-side discovery, right? Client-side load balance. 
So anybody can tell me what is the load balancing, how the load balancing work? Load balancing is one of the concept of that we normally find problem when we design our system, distributed system. Yes, sir. To like so when balance. we send, okay, yeah, when we send any request, so that time, like uh, uh, server will uh, will get the response from server, but based on the availability of the server, uh, whichever uh, available. So it will re redirect the request to that particular server, and from there we'll get uh, the response. No. Load balancer actually is a separate component. That's it before you service. OK? So it's a separate component. That's it before your service instances. What it does, it basically use different kind of algorithm to evenly distribute the load. What is load? Here, HTTP request or HTTPS request, right? Or API request. So when that API request comes in, I have three server instances. I can, if say there are 99 dis requests are coming. So I'm equally distribute them. 33 requests goes to the service A instance one, 33 next instance two, and 33 after that instance. Okay. And it can also evaluate how much latency is there, what is the CPU usage, etc. Those matters if we calculate, it can better utilize the unused or less slow processing server instances than it. Redirect the services. So, <coughs> the load balancer does what? It distributes the load. It looks through matrices of how the health of the server instances in terms of CPU usage, memory, latency, and it forwarded the request based on a certain algorithm. One such algorithm that I mentioned previously is a round robin. You give it service. Instance one, first request, service instance two, second, third, then again one, two, three, like this. So now, when you actually request, you don't directly call the service A and service B, don't directly communicate. Because their the service instance can come and go, right? You have a service registry which stores the DT. Right? Now, you get to know there are now three instances are there. Okay? The service B wanted to call a service A. They find the addresses of service instance A. Okay? Then, it's going to choose one of the instances. Now, if that load balancing happen on the client side. So you use a client side library or a framework to do that load balancing. So you don't need to require a separate server side or application load balancer. You make that decision from the client side load balancer with certain algorithm, and you can choose the most suitable instance of the service A to make the call. This will helpful to evenly distribute the load and all the your server instances are then equally have the request process. Otherwise, if you have like three instances and you are always sending the request to the first instance, what happens? Only one server is over utilized. The request processing gets slow. Other services are up, but they are not serving anything. So here, the main point is the load balancing is happening on the client side. That is, service B is the client from service A, and there the load balancing is happening. There is no specific load balancer is there before the service A. 
Did you guys got it? Client side load balancing concept. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, what are the projects we have out here? You can check. So Netflix has started with Ribbon, but like most of the projects, this will not be maintained. So Spin Cloud Load Panel is replacing Netflix Ribbon. You can choose your uh, different algorithm. You can choose which one to activate. And you can have extensive configuration. You can add additional configuration towards that. And it has a reactive support. So it <laughs> supports being WebFlux framework. So here the load balancing, do remember, happening on the client side. Now circuit breaker. During Netflix session, we have also talked about this. So there is a circuit breaker image now. So can anybody explain what is circuit breaker? How it is work? And why the circuit breaker concept or pattern has been introduced? What is the benefit of it? So means if there is a means uh, overhead in the network traffic, then we are using this tool circuit circuit breaker. No. So take an analogy, right? You have a switchboard in your phone, right? And you have like a MCB or triple, right? So when there is an electric surge, what happens is the tipper falls down and your circuit gets open and there is no current is current it flows, right? If the power surge is down, then you switch up the tripper or the MCB and again the circuit gets closed and electricity between your electronic devices start flowing. It is the same concept. The concept here is failure mitigation. There are going to be failure. It may be a network failure. It may be service logic failure. It may be latency timeout issue, right? So service B is now calling service A. Oh. Now, as long as there are like all 200 or 201 request responses are coming, my circuit of request and response between the two services are closed. Or they're green, right? Now, see, there are some failures are occurring, right? And I can choose a threshold. So if there are like 60% failures are happening. So I'm sending 100 requests, 60 requests are being made. So I want, see, there is some problem is there. Maybe the service is down or something. Now, I don't want the request to be flowing to the currently problematic service B, uh, service A, right? So now what happened? Let my MBC, MCB. Now the circuit becomes open. So failure circuit is now open. Okay. Now it can go to another half stage, half open. So again, some requests are going through. If say <coughs> the problem is there is a timeout error occurs. Okay. Or maybe the other threshold improves. So it becomes half open, right? And if there is from half open step, if there further failure happen, then it becomes to open. And now next when I get a success message, then my circuit gets again closed and the both services are now become healthy. So why we need to do the failure mitigation? So if say I'm of a group of service, Right, and we have talked about the concept of service chain. So it is not that the one service is doing everything, right? So for example, say I'm transferring money, or maybe there's uh, okay. 
say there is a reward card. Okay. So in the reward card, what happening is I am person currently holding a card. So maybe I wanted to, as a one of the incentive program that the card company bring in that I can nominate one of my friends for fresh card application. And if the particular person, you know, I send him an invite link and the particular person has a good uh, head score, etc. It's not fraudulent. It has a sufficient good credit ranking. Then his application goes through, right? And then I'm going to be getting some reward as a fulfillment because I bring another customer to that card organization, right? Now, there may be service say going, which is taking the card detail validation, then there's some business rule being executing, then there is another service is going, which is calling a third party API. And third party API means another team API. Another API may be down currently. So what happened is, the request processing now we failed, and whatever you know requests that have been processed, the whole chain of requests have been failed. So, if the third party pay get failed, my service get the particular service get failed, with the which is determined that okay, I will be transmitting bonus. So user will not get the bonus. Now, the request for validation business rule. That API call get failed. Then the main API that is, you know, after the API gateway, we started the request. That is also get failed. So what is happening? If a failure occurs in any kind of microservice chain, one fails, the next one fails, next one fails. So it's cascade up, right? So we don't want that one bad service, my whole operation maybe get failed. Because when it get filled, what happened is the all the database commits I have written all get rolled back. Correct? Because transaction is not yet committed. So so I have lost that the user is eligible for fulfillment. User can again retry. But again, he has to start from the very beginning. Okay. Instead of you know third party to transmitting the benefit, we can say we can fall back and we can update the status in our database that you are eligible for the bonus. Please try after some time. So there is like a fallback functionality in case of failure that it goes into it doesn't throw up the error, so it's bubble up in the API call chain or microservice call chain. Okay. What are the different certificate implementation is there? So there is like spring retry, which you have continuously retry a request in case of a timeout or error happens. It can retry, say, once. Take a, take a gap, okay, a few seconds. You get retry. Second failure, it takes a bigger gap. You get retry, and after the data, it dropped the request and it falls back where <coughs> alternative method which update the user status to be fulfilled. Okay, to be fulfilled with the bonus. Bonus may be cash, maybe uh, miles for my air travel, maybe a statement, edit bonus, anything as per the scheme. Okay, that one <coughs> simple thing did try. Another library that is there is Resilient Fortune. It does the same thing. And Spring Cloud, if you're using Alibaba, it is Sentinel. That is their product that they can use. <coughs> it has a reactive support, and you can choose a different algorithm for controlling. The threshold levels or something else, I'm not When you think 
that particular circuit is currently open or half open, those kind of configuration. So, so retryability is basically a retry. So these are the project retry the fail request in case of it is not gone through after a certain number of retry, which is always configurable. You can fall back a method and update the DB status. This is the example I'm giving. Now, the concept is distributed tracing. What is distributed tracing? So, like here you have the example, right? <coughs> E-commerce application. I can run on browser on mobile application. It goes to API gateway. User added some product into the cart. So it goes to the cart service. So before you go to the cart service, you have got to check of the inventory service. Okay, do we have holding sufficient inventory? Where the inventory is there? Is it in the south of India, north of India, which go down the inventory has currently? It looks up the inventory database to give the detail. So now I find this request to be taking a lot of time. Then how can I debug? It is not a single log, single service, single log. And even if I enable the log, the log is written in two separate files. How can I correlate <laughs> if I try to find out by the time time? Okay, this time term, the event has occurred, bug has come to me. I have to sort it out. So I look into this timestamp, then I have to look into another uh, log file of inventory service, see where the issue is, are there any log? And this two log doesn't have any common request pattern, right? Something common request which can identify these are part of the same request. So that visibility, I don't have, I don't know that for the current request, what are the individual services spending? Where it's taking the more time? Is it the database query that is taking more time? So you write different trace statement. You enable that. But you need to connect them together. So you get to see a visibility for a particular request. So that's what distributed tracing does. And it, again, stored in a centralized server. So it is in lots of hard work if we need to go service by service. It's just two services of one. There may be multiple services. <laughs> so Spring Cloud has a project for this. Uh, that's known as Spring Cloud Slow. So it helps us troubleshoot across the distributed services. It's support for tracing. You can use with Spring Framework also, Spring Boot also, or Spring Cloud. Also, so here is a sample screenshot. So in this screenshot, what you are figuring out? Yeah, sir, we we can use Zipkin also, right? So why? Yeah. Are... Smooth is another project. Zipkin is another project. The multiple projects are there, right? Yes. But the concept is same, right? So it's showing that what is the total request taken in the service one when the request came in, right? What is the time? Okay, how much time it's been in the individual request, individual server, okay? Then what is the next service? How much time it's going to spend on the service? So you get to see all of that. Okay, next comes the API gateway. Any idea why we require API gateway? Sir, like when we are using something like the reverse proxy between client and backend servers, we can apply filters and routers for backend. We can use Spring Cloud Gateway for that. Hmm. So reverse proxy is there. Filtration is there. You can modify the request response headers. You can implement authentication along with that, right? So some common concerns that you don't want it to implement into each of the services, you can implement that in a configuration-based uh, API gateway. Okay, Spring Cloud Gateway. 
This is the implementation for API gateway. You can use it as Spring Boot. It supports everything. Rate limitation. That means you can control <coughs> how many requests can we go to. For part service base, you can configure. You can enable load balancing out here. You can do service discovery configuration. So everything can be integrated with this. And the distributed tracing also. Now, after all those components that we have seen, now if we wanted to re-architect this, so how are we going to do that? So we're going to do that by making each of the services a Spring Boot application. OK. And each having uh, one this service, below service, card application service, now going to be using a hindsight load balancer. It's going to register itself with the Eureka service discovery. And Spring Cloud Gateway will be there between inter-service communication. It, here we're going to be enabling the cloud Spring Data Tri and the circuit breaker. Each of the services is going to be reading its configuration from the Spring Cloud config server. And matrices can be connected. OK. And all those other services also have like circuit breaker input. So let's see now the sample code. Then we can end it with other projects that are there. OK. So this is a Maven project. Here we have the card service. Then you have Ford verified service and the user service. The C services that are there, all are Spring Boot application. Now here you have the config server. Discovery service is the Eureka service. And client gateway that is out here. OK. <laughs> So let's just figure out how the configuration is, how the config service is set up that we have previously seen, but we can just go over that. So basically, you just have to enable out here config server. That's it. That's all you need to enable it for. Now, on the configuration side, you say which port this needs to be run. And here you can say, OK, this will be the Spring Cloud Config Server. Spring Cloud Config Server will be using Git. And within a Git, it's going to have this particular URL, where it's going to be reading the configuration form. And if you look into the POM, straightforward it using also here slope that is enable that distributed tracing and spin cloud config server model that is also enabled these are the two dependency it has and nothing more next comes is your Eureka server. So in the Eureka server, what do you have? You get another enable Eureka server endpoint, just a service, and the configuration. So configuration, again, you are running in a different port. OK. So this Eureka client, you don't want it to register itself or fetching the registry, so you're making this false. So management endpoint, you want to be exposed metrics and Prometheus. So you can collect that. And Spring application name, you have defined. That's it. That's all you have to define to get a Eureka server. Now, next one is the gateway proxy or your API gateway. So 
there two files are there normal application configuration the proxy config so proxy config custom route locator so what is saying when the request come that user service route then you just redirect this to user slash the service and method is post and the filtration with string strip the prefix one and url is lp load balancer user service that's it now here you will look into the configuration Now here, what we have, the cloud gateway routes, routes going to define. So we have different services that are there, forward verifier service, okay? So it says that if the forward verifier services come, use this URL. Predicate is, which paths will be matched to this? This is forward verifier. If that is in the path, that is there. And here also the retriability has been also added. And with the Eureka client, health check has been enabled, log level is debug, and the normal exposure of metrics and Prometheus. So that being the basic configuration done. Now all the basic services we have followed, So this is just a request response object is there. So let's just go into the card service. So, okay, let's go also look into the configuration. Um, what are the dependencies we have to include? So here, if you look into the dependencies, Starter Sleuth has been added. Spring Cloud Starter Netflix Eureka Server has been added and Micrometer registry Prometheus has been added to expose the metrics that are out of here to Prometheus is version. <coughs> that is in Eureka server. Get a proxy, find gateway. We'll have those dependencies. Spin Clyde, starter gateway, sleuth. Eureka client and actuator and micrometer. That's all <laughs> that is there. Now let's see into the cloud service. So cloud service has many things. So here, normal spring boot application. Now here you have the different projects are there client application, card application, and the card application controller. Okay, so when the application comes, it comes out to here. So request body is the card application DTO it takes, then card application service is called with that particular DTO, which returns the card application client, and then get application URL ID is built with, and then, It says it's created with this particular URL. You can get the detail of it and the body of that result. That's all. Uh, now the coming to the service side. What is the service side is doing? It having the user service client. So obviously, card service is calling the user service client. So when it's calling the user service client, so obviously we require here it is using the web. A template you can you guys can also do the web flux and here you are doing the configuration based on a discovery client so you are enabling the discovery client both two we have included now using discovery client what you are calling you are getting the service instance proxy so you are getting the api gateway and from the api gateway you got it, then you are calling user service registration method. So you're going to make a call to that with DTO and the user class. So that's how it is. Okay. There's no additional thing you require. Only thing you need to discover from one of the service instances. And then you get the URL and your 
making the call. So it will be like LB slash user service slash user service then registration. Okay. So this template here, if we are using load balancer, so load balancer client has been added. So it is basically for verifier. And you have a two kind of uh, risk template. One is not load balance. That is a risk template that we are using for user service call. Another is load balancer template. OK, and that is basically load balancing against the Ford verifier service. So before that, what happened here is the verification going to happen. So verification service client will come. And in the verification going to service client, we're going to be calling load balance. Load balance, because our configuration is here, what? Load balance. So load balance, rest template. So Spring Cloud Road Balance is used, the same annotation and put it. And we can also give its name and qualified way. You can also have that. And the verification you're going to do. So here you're going to be from the HTTP instances, port, card verifier, UID, and the card capacity, etc. And it's making the call to that. And user service client is simple client that you have seen. Here you have the load balancing client configuration that is here. So now the important thing will be looking into the bootstrap. So this is also reading from the cloud config. So bootstrap is when the application get bootstrap, that where you issue the cloud config. So it can read the configuration from there. And then you have your normal application configuration. So application configuration, what is we are seeing? Here <coughs> you are getting from the config server. So what is the difference between this bootstrap.yml file and the application yaml file? Yeah. So bootstrap.ml file is the first YAML file that will be loaded during the bootstrap process. OK. So here you can mention the any configuration that can be required during the bootstrapping process. Correct? That is when your application is getting started. OK. And your normal application configurations are mentioned in a application config file. Okay, during the start phase, we are using that. Yes. So now the question may be a question is where are you going to be placing a property? So here the configuration property is placed, right? Mm -hmm. Hmm? And it can be also be placed during your application AMA. So you can place it for both of the places. So how, what is the order in which it need to be loaded? So for example, bootstrap YAML is always loaded before your application YAML file, okay? So, for example, right here in bootstrap.loader, where you have mentioned, you have mentioned your Spring Cloud config URL. OK. So that you can put there in your bootstrap YAML. OK. And so normally it is. That's the order of loading. And where you need to be configured something or enable something that you can you know put in a bootstrap VML or bootstrap properties file before the your application email file. So here typically we can normally see that we put 
the spin cloud config url or application name into there and register the property in the application.ym Okay. Now coming back to the application properties file, what is happening here also? Refresh method has been included. So what is if we call the refresh method? What happened is it basically again read from the config server and refreshes configuration detail. Okay. So that you can put what is your port localhost 9080 slash refresh so it will read from there so we have seen the details of two kind of res client <coughs> one is load balance res client all over one is just simple res client okay and if this one server need to call another server, it can simply call the discovery client to get one instance. And there you don't need to put the URL of that from instance. You can get the URL and make a call <coughs> in server load balance. You have the load balance and okay, where do you eventually <coughs> putting that? And then you can put the particular server URL path query, etc. So it automatically determine. So here you don't using choosing any instances. Correct. Rather here you are actually choosing instance. Here you are choosing find any. Correct. Or find first, find last. But there is I am not actually load balancing is happening. And the cloud config is basically says how the configuration is set up. That is basically purely configuration given. That is our gateway box. Okay. Like here, the path verifier has been mentioned, which is load balance. That's why you find that load balance URL has been working for it. It also has a retry enable. So you can enable retry out here, circuit breaker, racing, etc. You can enable here. So any other questions? Okay. Apart from these projects, there are other projects are also available. Like declarative client that you have seen is the open thing, contact base, integration, uh, spin cloud contact, data pipeline processing using spring data flow, stream event processing using spring cloud string, lambda function or serverless function, we have spring cloud function. Then event burst, you have screen cloud burst, and short or long leaf tasks. Generally, you have screen cloud tasks. <coughs> Those are the other projects that are on screen cloud. So we'll be gradually follow whatever you know concept we today understood. We're going to be seeing this in detail in this month. Any other questions? No. Oh. Thank you guys. Let me close the session.